So diving in, I mean, the topic is really about human capital standards, the greater, I guess, all slightly larger issue of disclosure, uh, positioning it as a new era for HR. So this is intended to be uh, a bit of a panel. And so what I'd like to do is we'll just introduce each of, each of the, our panelists, uh, including myself, for a minute or so, and then uh, let, them, let them cover it. And then we've got just a few slides to help kind of talk of, of facts and background. And then we want to we want to hear from you and have some questions from you. And of course, we've got some some of our own opinions that we're happy to discuss and share as well. So Jeff Higgins, founder and CEO of uh, HCMI. I've actually spoken at the PEFAL conference the last two years. This is the third year uh, charging the windmill on human capital standards. The first year I was here, I was kind of saying, I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. But it hadn't happened. Then in December of 2018, we got standards. Uh, 2019, we had an SEC proposal, and so on. So it's actually happening. And uh, uh, the marketing people tell me I'm always way too objective when I get the, the standards hat on. So I do have to mention uh, we're a vendor downstairs, HCMI. We have some amazing software called Solve that's 100% ISO compliant. Uh, so en enough commercial. Let me introduce uh, really a fantastic, we're very lucky to have, Paul Herman here, the CEO of Hip Investor, to represent kind of the investor perspective. We hear from HR on the HR perspective so much. Paul has a very different perspective, so please. Oh, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here. Uh, my sister is a uh, head of has been a head of HR for hundreds of uh, employees in manufacturing plants. So um, I just want to. She I asked how I could win you over as uh, HR leaders, and she said, uh, "I'm not here to sue you." <laughs> So uh, I'm Paul Herman from HIP Investor. HIP stands for Human Impact and Profit. And so for the past 14 years, what we've done is rate every investment for its net positive or net negative impact on society. And the three biggest impacts that companies have are on people, on planet, and trust. So part of today, we'll talk about people as an asset. Um, so we have a portal that uh, showcases our 8,000 global equities. Um, we've written a methodology for how you can do good and make money in a portfolio. So that's described in this HIP Investor book here, uh, which is a, a textbook in 28 universities, including Stanford, um, as well as an ebook and audiobook. And later this year in 2020, we'll have the Global Handbook of Impact Investing uh, come out. Um, we also help advise on 401k plans, uh, as well as deal with investor relations on how they can showcase what they're doing inside related to people, planet, and trust. All right, uh, next slide. Why don't we uh, introduce uh, Doug Hopp from Stanford University. Hello, everyone. I'm Doug Hoppe from uh, Stanford University. I lead a people analytics uh, HR function within the uni university HR organization of, of Stanford. So that is really uh, servicing mostly the staff, but we get into other stuff as well. Um, I am a relative a newcomer to the ISO world. Um, I heard about it about four months ago at a uh, Society of HR Management uh, conference. Uh, one of the speakers was talking about things that are very dear to my heart, which is really trying to quantify value of the things that we're doing. So he was basically showing a lot of stuff that would put dollars <laughs> to things. So I think that's a really important concept in some of the stuff uh, as, a, as a practitioner. So um, I'm, I have a very strong practitioner view because I'm kind of in the weeds of all this stuff now and the, the work I'm doing. Uh, I have a background that spans finance, HR, and IT. So I look at, that, at things from, from those perspectives as well. Uh, but I see a lot of benefits um, with standards in the sense that uh, it may reduce the amount of time that we have to recreate the wheel. Uh, a lot of times we're trying to figure out how to define something that really should be defined already. <laughs> so I think there's quite a few things in, in the HR uh, metric space that are that way. Uh, the second thing is I want to find ways to uh, level up things um, in organizations. So. Uh, I think standards will do that because it will require uh, collaboration with uh, HR and finance in particular, but also other areas, because we have to all agree on how we're going to get to some of these things, particularly when it comes to like putting a value on something. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Doug. 
All right, so we're just going to fly through a few slides to give a little bit more background information, and then we want to go into discussion and Q&A. So CEO and stakeholders, so part of the challenge here, uh, and, and honestly, I'm not going to try to st steal any thunder, because I think uh, when you say where to invest, uh, that's Paul, that gets into Paul's territory. That gets into investors, asset manager territory. But if you just think about it, uh, CEOs have always intuitively understood that people are the most valuable asset. And they say so in investor calls and in annual reports. Our people are most valuable asset. Everything we do starts with people. You know, our people, our people are our source of competitive advantage. You know, talent is critical for our success. And then when you read through the annual report, there is nothing. Except if you look in the risk areas, they have a lot of human capital risks. Risks that we can't get the right people, that we can't retain people, that we're not developing people, that we don't even know what right people, you know, legal risks, compensation risks, labor, labor law risks, so all kinds of risks, but no disclosure in terms of what's actually happening. So there's a lot of questions, both internally, so from an organizational standpoint, your CEO would love to know, well, are we getting the best, and if so, how? And do we build by our rent? So a lot of questions. These are just a few samples. And ultimately, from an ESG, all of you are familiar with ESG uh, reports. And by the way, the majority of the S&P 500 are actually putting out, I think, 85 95%. Uh, feel free to correct me, Paul. No, about 95 percent. Yeah, okay. ESG is environmental, social governance. So from a governance standpoint, there's also not very much. One of the aspects of governance is are you effectively managing your business and your, most, your assets, of which the CEO just said people are most valuable. So are you effectively managing that human capital asset, let alone what Doug was touching on, which is how do we value that? By the way, accounting has a great way to value people. As a cost, is it any wonder why they're always trying to get rid of jobs? You're a negative. You're a cost. You're dead weight on the ship. We can boat can go much faster without you. Although, you think about it, at the end of the day, who's piloting the boat if everybody's thrown overboard? <laughs> so there's a there's a, a diminished law of diminishing you know diminishing returns when you get into that. So a lot of activity has taken place. So we're not going to rehash all of this. Suffice it to say that things have actually been accelerating. In December of 2018, ISO published the first global standard of human capital reporting. Not perfect. So if you download it, you read it, not perfect. But a great starting place. Some basic metrics, some good metrics, and a few really advanced great metrics. So that's really what it is. 23 for public disclosure for public listed companies, and 58, we're actually arguing with Germany whether it's 58 or 59 metrics for internal reporting. But at least now HR has the start of what we call GAP, generally accepted you know, principles for HR in terms of metrics and reporting. It's a starting point. And now, uh, in uh, August of last year, the SEC made a proposal to actually regulate and add uh, in the Reg SK disclosures an update that would include human capital as a material uh, or critical element to be disclosed and discussed. Or actually, I think we're not, discussed and disclosed. And so the comment period for that's over. It's really just now up to the uh, SEC to decide when that might take place. So. Uh, I'm not going to, again, not going to touch it. By the way, uh, just if you're looking for references, you can get a lot of information. One of my favorite articles, uh, I'm biased though, is the CFO uh, magazine report because they did a great summary on the ISO standard. They did something on what SEC is doing. They included some HR thought leaders. They included Dr. Jack. Many people don't even know Dr. Jack was really, we're all kind of standing on his shoulders as someone who started measurement in HR. Uh, so they had a section on him. And then they have some CFO perspectives as well. So it's a really nice, comprehensive, balanced perspective that's not too long. So if you're just looking for something to get caught up, that's a great place to go. You'll also notice at the bottom of some of these slides, there's a, a link for where to go to actually download the ISO standard if you want. By the way, ISO, they're not free. It's a nonprofit, so it's like $125 or something. It's not a big cost. Last thing is really now for you. How many of you, before we started speaking, and uh, it's biased. Some of you may have attended a Deb session that was right before ours. How many of you knew about the ISO standard and the SEC proposal prior to this? Show of hands. OK, looks like we're scoring about 20%. And not counting those of you who went over drinks that we talked about. <laughs> that we talk OK, so we scored about 20%. Well, that's a 5% improvement from last year. When I was here last year, it was about 15% of the audience was aware. So one of our goals is really just to raise awareness and also to have discussions about this. Uh, and really, as an organization, I would challenge you to figure out what are we doing and going to do. Because I, all ISO standards are voluntary. However, 
just like ESG reporting. ESG reporting is all voluntary, yet Paul just said 95% of organizations are doing it. Why? Because they feel they need to, because if they don't, they look bad because everyone else is doing it. So you can be one of the leaders and lead, and by the way, as far as I'm concerned, there's no downside to that. You get credibility and transparency points for being an early adopter. You can be prepared, and maybe then you can be a close follower, or you can lag, right? Ultimately, if you, if you do nothing, then when your organization, when the SEC says, now you've got to do it, most organizations are not going to be able to jump and get full compliance and accuracy on these metrics, basic as some of them are, in just a few weeks or months. So with that, uh, I'd like to stop and we can go to Q&A. But before we go to Q&A, uh, given the, the positioning that we've just discussed, we'd like to hear from both Doug and Paul. Sure. Um, I'll just give a couple more uh, overview remarks. So um, Jeff introduced people as an asset. And when a CEO says people are our most important asset, do you think they believe it? But here's our role in the room as uh, analytics people in HR, we can actually show it. So for the average company, labor is 55% of cost structure, and that's why they want to cram it down. But what uh, many people don't fully understand is the stock price today, stock price is like the future cash flows of the company, 84% of that stock price are by things that are not on the financial statements as an asset. So you have patents and trademarks and goodwill, but you don't have people as an asset. Now, sometimes people will say, well, we don't own people. You know, we're not going to have slavery and own people. No, but you do lease the productive capacity of people on a daily basis. So four PhD teams actually worked on this back in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and one of them, Baruch Lev, uh, if you get a chance to read some of his work on intangible capital, the, he essentially built his PhD thesis on how to value human as an, uh, uh, capital as an asset. And even Harvard Business Review in 1967, the year before I was born, published, put people on your balance sheet as an asset in 1967. And they showed one case study. So today the case studies are companies like Infosys uh, and a handful of a half a dozen others in, um, in India. But there's not a case study in the US or Europe or Australia so will you be the first? You could. You could be up here speaking about this next year. Um, the second thing I want to cover is um, uh, who here has an EEO1 statement? Everybody. OK, who here has a EEO1 statement that they publish externally? There's right, exactly. Oh, all right. And how do, you, how do you do that? How do you publish it? Okay, and is it 100% of the information on the EEO-1? Uh, it's a summary, so Okay, so that's something that you're leading on, that others in this room, I saw a couple faces like, why would we ever do that? Or how would the general counsel ever approve that? And this is what investors want. Investors want to know what is the proportion of women on the board, which you can see, but in executive leadership, supervisors, what's the um, ratios of people of color, uh, and are they in supervisory positions or not? And Credit Suisse has done a study, and we have slides to share with you if you'd like, that companies with more women on the board, and by the way, this only takes one woman on the board, uh, companies with more women on the board outperform financially, higher returns, and at less risk. You can just click one slide with the clicker. And so this is the chart from 2005 to 2015. So higher returns and less risky. So investors love this because investors either want higher returns or less risk. So investing in people and investing in diversity, so there's a North Carolina State academic paper that says more diverse workforces actually invent more products and patent more products, and therefore that leads to higher revenue growth. So investors are fully absorbing this. We've been doing it for 14 years, but now at Davos, uh, everybody seems to be getting on board. Um, uh, and so one of the other ways to get on board is, uh, Jeff mentioned this, publishing. And so working with your investor relations team to make sure that they're informed as to what they can report about using your HR analytics. And even um, doing what's called an ESG earnings call. And so if not in your earnings call, 
Uh, most CEOs mention people in their earnings calls. It's usually about what their cost per unit is, labor cost per unit, silly things like that. Um, what they should be talking about is what's our products per person that we invent, or what's our customer referral rate to a great customer service. Um, so those are things that can happen in, in HR analytics. All right, so finally, uh, from an HR perspective, and this can touch analytics as well, uh, who here has a 401k plan? All right, which of those 401k plans, uh, choices, fund choices, focus on people? And you probably can't answer that because you don't know which ones focus on people. Um, so we built this website called cleanportfolios.com where you could, uh, we're feeding in companies as they volunteer their information. Um, but you can look at what uh, each of the funds in your portfolio and talk to your benefits team um, and solicit from employees what they want to invest in. And so millennials and Gen Zers want to invest in investments for their retirement about the world, how the world's going to look, not now it, how it has looked. Um, and so to do that, um, there are ratings on not only companies, but on funds in the 401k plan. And we worked with a high-tech firm in um, Boston area to do this. And what that led to was engagement from the employees on saving for your future through your 401k plan that then got them asking, well, aren't our customers and suppliers in our 401k plan? And by having them our 401k plan, don't we need to do something different with our suppliers? And so what they started, and they actually got a grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, from the state, to fund a report on conflict minerals because their inputs were coming from uh, Congo and places in Africa, uh, and so that they could validate that they had non-conflict minerals as they sold to companies like Dell. And then there's a really interesting employee benefit that you could kick around, uh, um, but that uh, Duke University and Sierra Nevada Beer Company have done. Uh, they created employee benefit for energy efficiency. And so they did an educational program about the benefits financially of energy efficiency, and they actually kicked in some money uh, from the benefits program. And so that's something if you have um, uh, sustainable development goals, if you have CSR or ESG or SDGs, sustainable development goals, there's 17 of those, the United Nations uh, has done that. This helps solve for climate action, it helps get employees engaged, and it helps uh, make people more enthusiastic. So I'll just close with this for now, which is uh, we did some work for RELA, the Retail Industries Leader Association, and there's some external um, publications that you can find on the RELA site, rila.org. And during the course of interviewing retailers like Walmart and Walgreens, um, they said to us, um, we're surprised that we granted parental leave to people on the floor, and they're happier, and they're not turning over, and they want to stay with us. And this is stuff like our moms would say would be intuitive, um, but it's like revelatory for companies. So being able to show the financial benefits of retaining staff, engaging staff, and one of my favorite statistics, both because it's depressing but visionary, is do you know what the average employee engagement from the Gallup poll is of the 5 million people they've surveyed? What's the average employee engagement ratio? Anybody? 30, 40, so it's actually 20. So you could look at this two ways. One is only one out of five employees is engaged. I've put in a different frame. Employees are there five days a week. They're only engaged one day a week. So if we could get that to two days a week, we could double productivity and engagement. If we get it to three days a week, we could triple it. And so those are some HR analytics that um, could be useful in what you do. Doug? You know, that's not fair to follow Paul. I mean, he's not, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, you know, what, what actually strikes me through this whole conference, so this, I, I have been delighted in all the things that I've heard of this conference. Um, one of the words I hear a lot is trust. <clears throat> and I think that's a very important concept when we talk about this stuff. Because uh, to have trust people need to, to have confidence in what's being presented. And so, so if we have more confidence by people knowing that we're presenting this information, you know, 
it creates trust in the in and and you, you know like for instance you know if you if you're showing 55% labor costs and that's a bad thing you know and if you but if you ex are able to uh, explain it in a way that's that people have trust in how you are explaining what you're doing and the benefits that you are providing your your workforce um, I think that's very powerful. You know, it's a very powerful uh, concept that uh, I believe the standards could um, could in, you know pr improve the situation. So, um, and and the other thing, quite frankly, and I th I think a lot of people in high tech are are uh, are, sta are are shareholders, right? <laughs> so they're reading these uh, these statements too, or you know, some of them are, anyways, and. You know, if we're only getting like low engagement scores in 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 companies, um, we should be able to explain things to our employees, uh, either you know through internal or you know, but also external things too. If they read a, a company a report explaining something about you know how your talent uh, is doing on, in the company, the health, then uh, they should have trust in what they're seeing. All right, thank you, thank you, Doug. Questions? <clears throat> okay, from the heckler, I mean, uh, person in the front. <laughs> uh, before I get to my question, first of all, I'd never thought about the standards and trust before, and that's really cool. There's just this notion of transparency. Right now, employees think companies are doing like weird things to them, but that's because they have no transparency into what's going on, and that could, I don't know. Thank you. That, that was fantastic. Um, my question actually came up when Deborah was having her talk as well around when do we think something like you know the SEC might start to mandate this? I think you guesstimated maybe it's in the next year. I was just curious, when do we think that we'll start to see standards like this become enforced upon and you know really demanded from organizations in, in different areas? Yeah, so this is really interesting because while the SEC uh, in this administration uh, is not willing to entertain uh, things about emissions for all uh, reporting for all uh, for all companies greenhouse gas emissions reporting they're not willing to um, uh, they are uh, interested in and welcoming comments on how to do human capital and human capital standards. And having the ISO standard, the new ISO uh, 28000 standard, is a helpful way to then have, here's the minimum amount of information that they can just adopt. Um, because it took a lot of work to get the uh, CEO pay to median worker pay ratio uh, squeezed through with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and that finally started getting reported. And what happened during that process of setting up the CEO pay to median worker pay, the companies came into the SEC. We, c we can't count our employees, to which if I was an SEC commissioner, I'd say, really? Uh, I may need to have the auditors look into that. Uh, how are you paying people if you don't know who you are? Uh, they wanted to exclude consultants. They wanted to exclude part-time workers. So you'll see that show up in some of the CEO pay, the median worker pay, um, and that took an act of Congress. But the good news is um, the you know limited light uh, coming from the SEC, because they're also about to restrict individual shareholder rights to file proxies, uh, is human capital standards apparently uh, is of interest to the chairman, Jay, and, uh, and other commissioners. Um, I'll, t I'll take a whack, and then uh, Paul, please. So, um, the, I mean, the SEC's already made a proposal. There's some, there's some gaps in it, but it's a great start. Um, it is not prescriptive, meaning it doesn't tell you what metrics, but again, to Paul's point, it would be easy for an organization that wants to be compliant to just grab some of the ISO or all of the ISO metrics and say, we'll do that, and then you kind of get credit for two things uh, instead of one. Uh, but the comment period's done. It's really just up to them to say, when is it effective? They just need an effective date, a, uh, a conversion period for you know, medium size. They may, you know, they may want an implementation time frame for the largest 100 organizations or have some sort of a cutoff point, that, and they've done things along those lines before. Um, so they, it could happen as soon as this year. Uh, that would be pretty fast, probably too fast for a lot of big companies. <laughs> uh, that said, uh, a lot of European countries are very uh, strong supporters of ISO. They already had greater levels of disclosure requirements with international financial IFRS, international financial reporting standards, than US SEC requirements. And so they're moving forward to adopt. And we know a number of 
companies outside the U.S., Deutsche Bank, who was mentioned in a previous meeting, uh, Allianz, uh, Standard Bank, uh, just to name a few, that are already racing to be effectively fully compliant. And uh, actually, those three are effectively fully compliant already because they were reporting probably 75% of the ISO requirements. So they really only needed to up their game 25% to get there. U.S.-based companies have farther to go. Uh, the, so what I see is the rest of the world's already moving on this. And the U.S. has the opportunity to lead or lag. What's funny is the U.S. is pretty much a clear leader on analytics. We're doing more advanced stuff than most of the rest of the world. So why on earth would we be laggards on disclosure? It doesn't, it doesn't move us well. I don't know if you heard um, uh, Microsoft uh, speaking uh, yesterday afternoon, but they, they took a big leap of faith and disclosed a lot of details on diversity. And, uh, you know, and I, I cornered afterward and, and said, what are you going to disclose this year? Uh, because we're looking for companies to really take that step and disclose more. And, and honestly, you're going to get nothing but credibility points. Institutional investors uh, are really not looking to do the proverbial Rome thumbs up, thumbs down. Wow, dump the shares, get rid of them, they're terrible. They're not ready to pass judgment. They just want to have a conversation. And we were in a, a great group session uh, back in November, which had institutional investors with a lot of HR analytics heads and some HR leaders. And one of them said, you know, my management's never going to go for this. They're not going to want to do it. Until it's mandated, they're not going to want to do it. And, and they said, you know, we feel that, that you know, it's not, this is not ready for prime time. To which one of the institutional investors said, so you'd rather have us make judgments about you on nothing, which is what you disclose now. Or worse, social media... Um, uh, glassdoor.com, which is almost always bad. Is that what you want us to make judgment on before all the mouths drop? Oh. Followed by headshake. No, that's not really what we want. Well, then disclose something else. Set the record straight. Put, put a marker out there because even if you're terrible, let's say your turnover is really high, it doesn't matter. Just talk about how important is it to the business because it's differing levels of importance for everybody. And what are you going to do to improve it over time? And there are already investment firms that are using this. Um, and if you don't disclose, they're not going to invest in you. So NIA is one, NIA, based in Oakland, NIA Investments, uh, NIA Impact Capital. Uh, LVEST, which you might have heard of. Uh, so Sally Krawcheck used to be uh, a financial executive at B of A. Um, and uh, so that's LVEST. Uh, and then PAX Mutual Funds has a PAX uh, Women's Fund. So it's already being used. And then it's being used in any form of ESG integration. And environmental social governance integration. So the more disclosure. And what we found, like Jeff said, is um, still the way that we look at the world, we cover more than a million data points per year across these 8,000 companies. So we're, you know, form of analytics. And 34% um, of the material information is missing for us to look at what the leading indicators of financial value are. So companies who can close that gap, close that transparency gap, are, are more likely to be included in a portfolio that people want to invest in. And I understand that uh, for companies that actually are leaders to be fully in compliant in these standards, that Stanford's going to give you a leg up in the application process for your kids. No, <laughs> just, just kidding. Oh, sorry, Doug. Over to you. You're going to get me in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> I, I, I just had one other thing to say. It wasn't Stanford. So. But um, <clears throat> so I got really interested when I was uh, listening to a presentation, and I kind of I talked to the presenter afterwards and said, you know, how can I get involved? Um, I don't know if, a, if we were successful in that, but I, I, I do want to mention that I, there's, there is room for more participants on the American team. And since I've been in, and I've been in about four months, um, I've gotten to know, you know, colleagues here and across the world, actually. It's very interesting to also hear some uh, people around the globe. Uh, the one that actually that, that I talked to, the, the, the presenter was from Pakistan. So it wasn't even somebody from the US and he hooked me up into the US team. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think we're always looking for uh, people with new uh, fresh ideas from different organizations to be involved in that because I think that's really important for what gets uh, developed. How are we on time? Time for one more question? We have time for one more question, and I think uh, In the there's back. one over there from the back. Yeah. 
And if I could just make a request, the person disclosing their EEO summary information, I'd love to know more details after the panel. Um, so, um, so let's let's suppose that that uh, where I or, or someone else works, it, it is not likely that I'm going to uh, convince the you know leadership to to pr disclose these things, um, or it's or it's not a political battle I I want to try to fight right now or whatever. What um, what else in the message about these um, reporting standards could I still take away and still do something with, um, given that context? Like, like is there is there some improvement or, or something I could do? Um, but, you know, everything. What what can I do short of um, the the external uh, disclosure? Is there something else I could take away and and, and do if I'm in that situation? Um, I'll I'll take a, a thirty second whack at that. Uh, so there is something there is something you could do. You don't have the power to convince them. A lot of times, management. By the way, we're all as people. We're most we're more motivated by fear than we are opportunity. So we've been kind of addressing the opportunity side. Uh, what you could tell your management if, is your company public listed. Uh, yes. Okay. So as a public listed company, on upcoming uh, investor conference calls, resu results calls, typically results calls. All right, uh, quarterly calls. Um, what is the CEO going to say when someone on the call starts asking questions about their human capital metrics and performance? Do they have tap shoes that they can put on really fast? Because uh, what I would, and the way you could frame this, you could give a nice warning to your CHRO, to your investor relations team, uh, to your CFO, because none of them are going to be able to answer it. And so if someone's got the, the ISO standard out and they're using it as a playbook to ask questions, of the CEOs and put them on the spot during a call, they're probably going to struggle with the answer. And during that call, you know, let's say you're in analytics or you're the head of analytics, someone is probably going to come down from that meeting and say, hey, we're being asked by some institutional investors about our human capital performance on a couple of these metrics. Do we have that? Can you get us that ISO compliant report really quick? And who would want to be the one to say, we have nothing like that? Because I would imagine there's going to be some open cube space soon after the call uh, when that comes down and nobody's so. In yeah, other words, yeah. well, a different way, you need to be prepared. Yeah, a connected way to do that, um, my headline is lead by example. So take what you'd want the company to lead on and apply it to your group. And so either your working group, your division, your section. And what happens in large organizations, as we all know, is that becomes a pilot, essentially. And then when they get one of those, um, somebody on the call, hopefully, if not the CEO, the CFO, they're like, oh, yeah, we have, we're already doing this. That's the favorite answer when you get an uncomfortable question. Oh, we're already doing this. Oh, can you provide an example? So this happened early on, like with uh, wind energy. People pointed to their uh, wind farms in Iowa or Scotland or somewhere around the world. Um, so I'd say lead by example. Um, show the results, show the analytic results, and then apply those results. And so something that happens at Intuit, for example, is they do their um, annual uh, employee engagement, employee survey in November. And what happens at Intuit is the supervisor gets the results of all the employees in their group, the manager gets the reports of the supervisors, the executive gets the report of the managers. Um, and so you could do that in your own group. And uh, whether that be some form of engagement, some form of reporting and tracking, and then just lead by example and have it spread organically through the company, while also maybe doing whisper campaigns uh, or um, you know go into uh, there's another uh, group called asyousow.org, which has this um, website called Fossil Free Funds and uh, gender equality funds and diversity funds. And you can go there and type in the funds in your 401k plan and start to gather, uh, build a coalition inside the organization and sort of a whisper campaign, sort of quiet revolution at the same time. I, I just had just one other just brief thought is that, again, I'm on the practitioner side of, of this whole thing. So um, I think I would want to know sooner than later what's happening. Uh, so that if there's any alignment in things that I'm doing, <clears throat> I can be on the forefront of that. Uh, so that, that's, that's one thing. I, again, I think it also gets into, if it gets into some of these questions, well, I think this is the way you should calculate it versus this way to calculate it. 
you might have some more credibility in being able to reference something that says, you know, I'm actually trying to follow something that is becoming a, you know, we're seeing as becoming a global standard. So, so that there's that one frame. And I, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that the ISO scope of things is throughout really the whole life cycle of things that we're looking at for employees. There's stuff in there from uh, traction through retirement in, in, in ISO. So that, I think that's another thing that like people to understand that's not focused on just, let's say, turnover or diversity or something like that. I mean, there's stuff all over the place um, in the employee life cycle that's being worked on in ISO. Sorry, quick follow on. Don't keep that focused on me very long. Um, <laughs> I've done what you mentioned about the SEC and kind of dropped it in a very large meeting with some executives and they all of a sudden became super interested in it. I'm curious if you've already had an organization have that question on uh, a quarterly earnings call because what I've found is the easiest way to move the needle is to say, hey, this happened already here. Uh -huh. Let's not be caught off guard like this company. Uh -huh. Just wanted, wondered if it had started coming up anywhere. I mean, when you read the transcripts of earnings calls, which is part of what we do as investors, um, uh, is is it's increasingly being mentioned, but it's not mentioned on every call. Um, and then you have companies like Cisco, who uh, last year with UBS and this year with Goldman Sachs, they just did a one-hour call on human capital, environmental capital, social capital. And so you can do it adjacent to, and even just before or just after the earnings call, so that if you have to fight the CFO of what goes in the earnings call, and we're not going to talk about this soft stuff of tree hugging, then you can say, okay, well, let's just do it side by side. Or Dave Campbell, uh, Dave Stangus at Campbell's did this for a whole investor day, and so he brought um, uh, ESG, Environmental Social Governance Analysts, to the Investor Day. And they um, focused on financial issues with the ESG analysts and ESG issues with the financial analysts. And they did that to start cultivating a, a crossover. And so that'll start to happen more, I think, in 2020. So Campbell's did that early with Dave Stangus. Um, and then um, uh, people-focused businesses are starting to talk about it more. Parental leave, uh, fair wage, Best Buy is seeking to only hire internally. Costco has always hired internally. Um, and then also Best Buy is focused on hiring from the community. And so they're doing specific targeted recruiting outreach uh, to people of color, not only in their Minneapolis hometown, but in other um, uh, sites around the country. And I, I would add to that that uh, it is already happening. So there's a really large payroll company, in fact, the world's largest payroll company, whose favorite color is red, mm -hmm. who's already been posted up on that a few times. And also the world's largest retailer has been uh, approached and had, some, had I, know, I know the questions are being asked. Uh, so it, it is happening. And it's, uh, I think your only advantage is based on your size. If you're publicly traded, but you're not that big, they haven't gotten to you yet. Uh, and also, uh, because I'm, I want to be provocative a little bit, just a shout out, any of the major software development firms here, the ERP type providers? Okay. Work, work day. All right. So one of the things we need to help drive adoption, we need the major software providers to build ISO compliance into their software. You shouldn't have to figure it out every year or month or quarter or however, however often. You can, certainly. This is not rocket science. But it would sure be nice if you could have your systems, you know, press a button, get a compliant report uh, that you can then spend your time telling the story from as opposed to spending tons of hours putting it together and, and checking it for validity. All right. Thank you.